And thank you very much for joining us today once again for another episode of Ramadan with MTA. During the Belsed month of Ramadan, every weekday we're going to be with you and we invite you to join us as we take you through different segments in this program. And as always, we're going to start off with the recitation of the Holy Quran with the blessed word of God Almighty. Let's start with that. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أذن للذين يقاتلون بأنهم ظلموا وإن الله على نصرهم لقدير Permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made, because they have been wronged, and Allah indeed has power to help them. Those who have been driven out from their homes unjustly only because they said, Our Lord is Allah. And if Allah did not repel some men by means of others, they would surely have been pulled down cloisters and churches and synagogues and mosques, wherein the name of Allah is oft commemorated. And Allah will surely help one who helps him. Allah is indeed powerful. So these were verses from Surah Al-Hajj, verse 40 and 41. Here with us in the studio is Kamar Zafar Sahib. Assalamu alaikum Kamar Sahib and welcome back to Ramadan with MTA. Jazakallah for joining us today to talk a little bit more about these verses and to explain to our viewers at home again very briefly just the tip of the iceberg probably what these verses mean and what is it that we can learn from these words of uh, God Almighty. Kamar Sahib, it talks about permission to fight is given to those who have been wronged. I mean, you need to give a little bit of a context to people who don't know about this permission, who don't know about the Holy Quran, um, what, what situations you are allowed to fight back, defensive wars. And I think the lifetime of the Holy Prophet ﷺ comes into this as well to explain these verses through his life. So just to start off very easily, what is it that you can tell us? Well, this particular verse um, was actually it's widely accepted that it was revealed around the early times of when the Muslims migrated to Medina. Why did they migrate to Medina? And what were they doing before that? Um, because permission was only granted when they went to Medina. And they did not have permission to fight like, for about 14 years before that. And why? Because we already know. Although they were persecuted. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. Yeah. Because when they were in Mecca, when they were not in Medina, mm. they'd been exiled for two, three years in, in, in a barren land. And they were suffering. People had passed away. They were boycotted. Their businesses, their lives, their households. They, you know, even had to, they were even forced to leave and move to Abyssinia at one point. And they, this is how bad the persecution was. They weren't, you know, the opponents were not sparing women, children. They were literally having people like that you know, tied to a post um, and rope by rope, they had camels running in opposite directions to obviously harm these Muslims. And why? Why was all of this being done? Because they wanted to believe in one God. Mm. 
Mm. And we know that at that time, the Quraysh in the Mecca, they had this system of many, many different gods. And a lot of people from around the area used to come and they used to worship these idols. And that was a very good source of revenue for the people that owned these idols and worked in that industry. So for them to know that there is this a new religion, a new faith, which is talking about getting rid of their idols and <laughs> replacing with one good, for, from a business standpoint of view, it was not good for them. So that's why they were facing a lot of opposition. The Muslims, however, like we already know, did not actually retaliate to any of this persecution. People were being killed, like I said, boycotted. Nothing was done because God Almighty had not yet given them permission to do so. When they moved to Medina, and the whole reason they even then moved to Medina was again, because it was not safe at the moment for the Holy Prophet ﷺ to remain in Mecca. To the point that even on the night that he migrated to Medina, a bounty was placed on his head that whoever can bring the Prophet Muhammad dead or alive will receive a reward. And that is kind of how difficult the situation had become. So when they arrived in Medina, the threats of this opposition didn't just end there. They followed through. There was also opposition in Medina. But this time there was a slight difference as well. Because the Holy Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, he was accepted as the governor of the state. So not only did he have the responsibility of protecting the Muslims, but he also had the responsibility of protecting all of the citizens of Medina, whether that was the Christians, the Jews, people of no faith. And this verse gives permission in that scenario that because this opposition is consistent mm. and they are only opposing you because they want to suppress your freedom of religion, your freedom of conscience, that's what they're doing. And it's not just going to hinder your progress, but it's also going to affect the Christians and Jews living in that area as well. Therefore, you should stand up and to protect the freedom of religion, protect the freedom of conscience and have justice, you should then defend yourself against the opposition. And that's kind of in context what was happening. There was not a case of the Muslims having migrated to Medina and now them going on a missionary sort of mission to try and spread Islam through the sword. They, ha they couldn't even do that anyway. Mm -hmm. The Muslims at that time were pretty weak comparatively to the, to the Meccans. As we know, that as soon as they came to Medina, the battles of Badr, Uhud, Khandak, they all took place. And the single key thing to note in all of the battles is, the is that the Muslims were always outnumbered. Mm -hmm whether it was 300 to 1,000, whether it was 2,000 to 10,000, it doesn't matter. It was always a vast outnumbering, mm -hmm. not only in terms of physical men on the ground or, or even ladies, but it was also in terms of how much equipment they had. The Muslims had maybe, what, one or two horses, a camel, a few swords. The Meccans had a full armory of weapons, you know, armor, uh, you know, everything that you could think of that a military would have. Soldiers. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, every single time. Mm -hmm. Because they were fighting under the permission of God and with the support of God, they came out victorious. And it was because Holy Quran in, in this in the following verse, which we also listen to, God Almighty says that the whole reason you were told to do this, to go forward and fight, if you had not done so, then mosques, synagogues, churches, temples, they would have all been destroyed. And why? We wonder, why, what's that got to do with Islam? It's because if the opponents of Islam had been allowed to crush Islam, and that would never have happened. But if they had been allowed, they would have quickly realized that, hold on a minute, why should we stop at Muslims? Yeah. We can crush every single ideology out there. We can crush every single faith out there so that nobody can mess with our, interfere with our business. Nobody can interfere with our idols. And they would have got that idea and they could have been successful. But God Almighty cut that route right there and said that these Muslims, even though they're less in number, they will obliterate this opposition because they stand against freedom. They, get, they stand against the freedom of conscience. And that's just absolutely what it was. The Holy Prophet in the first battle was there the night before praying to God that, Oh God, if we lose today, if we, if we are wiped out today, then who will worship you and glorify you after us? And even he knew that physically, apparently they were outnumbered. But God Almighty understood that because again, their intentions were right, their motives were right, and they were doing it because they were given permission they weren't doing it out of their vested interests, then they were granted victory because of that. So that's basically that. Exactly. Like I, was, I think it's very important that you outlined and, and, and gave that introduction that why has this verse been revealed? What was what was the context of it? Because as you said, even, even in today's day and age, even in this year, <laughs> in the 21st century, you still have people with all the information available to us. We still have people who think that Islam was spread by the, by the sword. 
But then again, you neglect the 13, 14 years before actually this verse was revealed, before Absolutely. Muslims went out to defend themselves. Not to attack, but to defend themselves. And then again, we see the period after that. One interesting thing that you know I've come across as well, and in these verses that we're talking about today, the, the chronological order of these places of worships. The mosque is at the end. Yeah. You have every other uh, place yeah, of worship yeah. beforehand and, right. and the mosque is at the end. I think that's really beautiful as well because His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masur Ahmed, Ayyadullah bin Nasr Aziz, we've all heard it. Mm. The different annual conventions, uh, the peace symposiums, where His Holiness also knows that there are a lot of people in the public that must be wondering, what is this all about? This, pers- this so-called warfare in Islam, what, what happened? And His Holiness reiterates the same thing. That first and foremost, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu was there as a governor to protect the rights of even the non-Muslims. Yeah. And we know this, that even when the Christians of Najran came to pray and they, and they came to visit and they had no place to pray and they didn't have a church there, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu said, well, come and pray in the mosque then. Yeah. And that's the understanding that we have here, that we don't normally look at these things, we yeah. neglect these things, but the thing is that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu was always there, not just to protect the freedom of worship for Muslims and the place of worship for Muslims, but also for other believers, other faiths and creeds as well. Um, and as always, every program we remind you, um, there's only so much that we can say in this limited time, but the commentaries, the tafasir of Hazrat Basim al Islam and the Khulafa and you know different other literature and uh, books in the Jamaat are available to you. And this is the perfect time to make use of that and to increase our knowledge as much as possible during the blessed month of Ramadan. With that, we're going to go to our next segment and that is a narration of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Let's listen to the hadith and then have a, a few things to say about that after that. عن عبد الله بن عمر رضي الله عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال وهو على المنبر وهو يذكر الصدقة والتعفف عن المسألة اليد العليا خير من اليد السفلى حضرة عبد الله بن عمر May Allah be pleased with him has narrated In a sermon from the pulpit the Prophet of Allah may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him once enjoined charity, and at the same time advised against begging, and observed that the upper hand of the donor was better than the lower hand of the receiver. All right, um, uh, the connection between Ramadan and charity is, is also a very close one. It's a very important one. We see it from the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Wasallam. <laughs> that uh, I'm sure you can you know, shed some light on that. But throughout the year, this, it was part of his nature. With the month of Ramadan, that bring, bring, you know, brought out something special. You're absolutely right. Actually, Hazrat Aisha, radiallahu anha, um, the wife of the Holy Prophet sallam, mentioned that, like you said, throughout the year, the Holy Prophet sallam, used to help the needy, help the poor. But when it came to Ramadan, he ne- she never saw such a thing um, as great as that. He was so you know, at the forefront of spending in, in the way of the needy and the way of God, it was like a very fast wind. And that's exactly how he was likened to in terms of spending in the way of charity in the month of Ramadan. And in this particular hadith, um, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has tackled two issues, pr- pretty much hit um, two stones, you know, or two birds with one stone rather. <laughs> and that is that on the one hand, our responsibility should be to be those who give at the same time, it should not be a, we should not be those people who beg at the same time as well. And this is, in a nutshell, what it is. And this instills the dignity of, of, of a man or a woman or of, of people. And what it says is that no matter what kind of difficulty we're going through, we should not be those who give up trusting God. And we should always, no matter what happens, we should always be the ones who go out and we try to earn our way. We try and earn our money. There's that side of it. And like what you're mentioning, there is also the charitable side of it, that when we do see somebody who's struggling, even though they may not be asking for help, because this hadith is saying that we shouldn't be begging on the streets. So that tells Muslims that you have to keep an even keen, keen eye now on, on the ground, because we've already said that people shouldn't be asking for help. It's your job to go out and make sure that your brothers and sisters are okay, because they're not going to come to you for help. Mm. And we can see 
that Hadrat Umar anhu understood this so perfectly that when he became the Khalifa, the second Caliph of Islam, obviously people knew who he was. So to avoid being recognized, he would wear a cloak, go out in the middle of the night and go to house to house to make sure that there was nobody starving, that make sure that there's nobody hungry. And he would often find people. He would often find families who had children and they had no food in their pot, but their parents were just pretending to cook something so that they would at least have some reassurance that they're going to get some food. But they had nothing. And Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu knew that in conjunction of this hadith, these people would not come and ask him for help. So he had this heightened sense of responsibility to go out there and help people on the ground. Now, who do you see today that does that? That literally goes out there as a leader, finds time to go house to house and just make sure that everyone's okay. So this hadith really reiterates the responsibility of, of us as Muslims that we should be on the lookout because people will not always come to you for help. It's, it's our responsibility to do that. It, and it wasn't always that even when he wasn't recognized, <laughs> he wouldn't say, I'm, I'm Umar. <laughs> I mean, people would find out later. Absolutely. This was the beautiful exactly how he was. Um, that's that's the that's the qualities of a leader, no doubt about that. Um, Kamsa, just very briefly, I'm, I know you 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 spoke about this, but this this term of the upper hand, the lower hand, um, for some of our younger viewers, maybe you might be wondering what's yeah. what's the upper hand. Yeah, I think it's simple, simple, very simple terms. In terms of upper hand, it means those who give, who give in the way of God, who give in the way of the needy. The lower hand doesn't mean that the, po the it literally means someone who's who's begging, and to beg doesn't mean that somebody. You know, someone really needs help. They, today we have services, you can go and get help. What it means is that you come up on the street, you give up completely. You don't go and find a job. You don't try to earn your money, even though you could. And that's what it's called. That's the lower hand. Not to not, absolutely not work. So just to explain this, when the Holy Prophet Sallallahu said this, there were a couple of companions, such as Hazrat Ali. When he heard this, he went out and he could find no means of uh, financial income at one point. And he, had, he said, look, I know this. This is what the Holy Prophet Sallallahu said. So I am going to go into the jungle, I'm going to go into the forest, and I'm going to cut sticks, and that's what I'm going to sell. And I am not going to resort myself to begging. And he went and he did that. And there were so many others, Hazrat Hakim bin Hazam um, radiallahu anhu, who, was, who heard this hadith, and then later on he was fixed a stipend by Hazrat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, and he said, you know what, I'm not even going to take that. I'm going to go out, I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to do it. And that was his own personal faith that he went out and did. What it also reminds us, very importantly, is that even when you are helping someone, you shouldn't make them feel like they're being helped. And you shouldn't make it apparent like you're doing them a favor. Yeah. And we can see this because Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu, who I also already mentioned, at one point was a bit financially uh, facing difficulties. And it was the time of his marriage. And obviously, you know, when it's the time of your marriage, you do need funds, you need something. So he was thinking, how am I going to fund my marriage? And he didn't really want to, obviously, in light of this, these, ask anybody. So Hazrat Uthman radiallahu anhu, who was also the third caliph of Islam, he was a wealthy individual, but he knew of the situation. Even though Hazrat Ali never complained to him, he knew that he must be going through a difficult time. So what did he do? He said to Hazrat Ali, he didn't go and say to him, oh, here's some money, take it. Yeah. You're poor, take it. He didn't, he didn't say that. He said to Hazrat Ali, oh, Hazrat Ali, you have a really nice shield here. I like this shield, I'd like to buy it from you. I'd like to purchase this shield from you. And I'm going to give you this amount for it because I think it's a really good shield. So I'll give you this much money. And so rather than giving it as a charity, he gave it in, in, in sort of a business. So Hazrat Ali never felt like he was being helped. And the most loving and, and kind of, I think, uh, lovable thing about this is that at the time of his marriage, on the wedding day, Hazrat Usman radiallahu anhu came and he gifted that same shield back to him. He said, Hazrat Ali, this is a very nice shield. I like it. I want to gift this to you. So without making him feel like I'm just giving you some charity, he also gave him his gift, his item back, and then also gave him his money. And the dignity and the respect was kept intact. So this is a really beautiful way to do that. Zakla, thank you so much for sharing those uh, incidents and narrations with us and for, to explain, uh, for explaining us that hadith. Our next segment is the cooking segment. As we said in the previous programs as well, every day we take you to a different studio, empty studio around the world. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to go to Australia today. Let's take a look. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Today I'm going to show you a really simple way of doing a roast leg of lamb. Now it's simple because we're only using two ingredients. Aside from the lamb, of course, we're going to use salt and pepper. What's going to take 
The leg of lamb up to the next level, however, is we're gonna use charcoal, and more importantly, my secret or not so secret ingredient, we're gonna use wood smoke. We've got our charcoal inside this thing here, which is called a chimney. This allows us to get the charcoal lit up nice and quickly. Um, underneath that, I've got some fire lighters. We'll throw the chimney on top of the charcoal and we'll let it start to burn. All right, as I said, we're gonna throw some salt and pepper on it. With the salt, just when you think you've put enough salt on there, throw some more on. Whilst we're doing that, I'll talk about the different cuts we've got here as well. On your right hand, we've got a leg of lamb with the bone in. And on your left, we've got the boneless leg of lamb. And we've also got a standing lamb rib. And for these sorts of barbecues, you have air coming in and you've got air going out. It's the perfect balance of that air coming in and out that allows you to cook the food to perfection. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna put the charcoal from the chimney into the barbecue. The little charcoal holder. Beautiful, we'll fill it up. Okay, so we'll give that a couple of minutes to get nice and hot. With the cuts we're using today, we'll just cook them at an average temperature around about um, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, actually, there's a converter here. So yeah, anywhere from 150 Celsius to 180 Celsius. I think that barbecue's had plenty of time to heat up. And now I'm gonna put the leg of lamb onto the barbecue. If you're gonna choose some smoking wood, make sure you know exactly what it is because it can mean the difference between a really delicious, outstanding succulent cook and a disaster which, you, which no one will wanna eat. Okay, so we're gonna use the cherry wood. I'll throw the cherry wood on. What we're gonna do, as I said earlier on, we'll cook it at about 180 degrees, which is the traditional temperature for roasting. Uh, it will, all that means is that the center will be medium. And then as it, as uh, you move out to the outside surface of the meat, it'll, it'll be more well done the further out you move from the center. That's all that's gonna to happen today, which is not a big deal. The advantage of that sort of cook is if you've got a number of people coming who like different doneness, okay? Some will get your medium, some will get your medium well, and those who like well done, I don't know why you'd eat meat well done, but those who like meat well done, they can even have what they enjoy. Um, okay, so we've got that cooking now. Uh, we'll keep on monitoring, and as I said, we'll make sure that the times are spot on so that we start getting uh, these cuts of meat on there too. Now, I know you don't make friends with salads, right? Or sides in this case. The meat is the main attraction, and that's why most people will come to eat barbecue. But we're gonna make some sides, very basic sides, and we'll start off with a potato bake. All I've done to this potato bake, for the sake of efficiency, um, we're making a potato and sweet potato bake. I've just sliced the sweet potato and the potato into nice thin slices. I've I laid one layer of sweet potato and potato on the bottom of this uh, oven proof dish. And then I put some, uh, a sauce which I made out of uh, butter, milk, flour, sour cream and cheese. I just mixed that all up on the stove, cooked it up, heated it up, melted it together. So I put that sauce over the layer of potato, just get it in there, it'll all melt together and mesh together and during the cooking process and the potato will soften. The potatoes aren't cooked at all, they're still raw. Last thing is I'm gonna get some cheese. You use whichever cheese you want. I personally like mozzarella. If you like different flavors, use whichever cheese you want, whichever one suits. Uh, you can lay the cheese inside it too if you wish. Uh, I haven't done that because it's already in the sauce. So I'm just gonna spread this cheese over the top. All we're gonna do from here now is we're gonna pop that in the oven for probably about an hour. All right, and hopefully we can get it to be ready when all the meat's ready. There's one more thing we're gonna put into the oven alongside the potato bake. That's cooking in there nicely. I just had a look at it, it's browning really beautifully. I've got some asparagus. Uh, I've put some salt and some pepper and I found some bottled garlic in the fridge. It's not the most ideal. I generally like using fresh, but that's all we had. So that's what I throw on there. doesn't matter. Once again, just be creative, do whatever suits you. Once that goes in the oven, 
the last thing that we're going to do before uh, the meat cooks is we're going to very quickly flash uh, char these vegetables here. We've got zucchini and we've got carrot. I've just put some mixed herbs and some salt on those. And really all we're going to do is we're going to cook them in this gas barbecue, which is going to be screaming hot. We're going to cook them directly over the flames. We're going to uh, cook them very quickly for probably two, two and a half minutes aside, get that nice char on them, and then we're done. Righto, we're about an hour into the cook. I reckon, and I might be wrong here, but I reckon it's time to put the boneless leg of lamb on. So we'll take the lid off, throw it on the side. The lamb's browning up quite nicely. So I'm gonna get this boneless leg of lamb now. I'll make sure there's enough room on there. Again, away from the heat, because remember it's an indirect cook. I'll put the fat side up. People are, have their very strong opinions about it. Some people um, also argue about whether meat should be fat side up or fat side down. I'm gonna put fat side up. Hopefully, this is the last time we have to take the lid off. That is looking, the leg of lamb is looking absolutely outstanding. The other one is probably just heated up. It hasn't really started in the cooking process yet. So you will do it so the camera can see. Lovely, we're around about 38, between 38 and 40 degrees, internal temperature. Still got about 40 minutes to do, 40 minutes to go rather. Last one, the lamb rack. I'll put that on with the fat facing the flame so that it acts as a little bit of a barrier between the uh, direct heat and the meat so that it doesn't uh, cook too far over. I reckon that's about it. We'll throw the lid back on. And now it's just a waiting game. Another 40 minutes hopefully and all that should be good to go. Okay, the moment of truth. Let's see how we're going. That is looking absolutely gorgeous. I've got a hungry bunch of people looking at me. And I think they're fed up to be honest. All right, beautiful. Bonus leg, the rib rack, and then the big fella, the lamb leg. Look how awesome that looks. We'll start off with the uh, boneless, boneless leg. Okay, that's outstanding. Still moist, tender. The smoke ring is quite well developed. And we'll do the the rack. Here we go. Ah, oh, that is outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. The last one, look at the juices. You got the juices overflowing over the cutting board onto the table. It's absolutely pouring out of it. All the juices pouring out of it. Look at the smoke ring on that. Really well developed. And you'd think after two and a bit hours that it would be. So without much more delay, I've got a plate ready to go. Into that plate. I'm going to throw some of our boneless leg. I'm going to throw one of our standing rib roast pieces, lamb rack pieces, and also a couple of pieces from the leg of lamb. And there you have it, plate ready to go. It's nice and crispy, full of flavor. I really appreciate you guys joining us for lamb on the Barbie done Aussie style. Thank you very much. Asalaamu As Alaikum Rahmatullah. I'm not sure how you felt, but I think barbecue done Aussie style passed with flying colors. <laughs> oh, I don't know what's wrong with meat being well done. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was absolutely amazing. Wonderful. Um, now with that, we're going to return to our second last segment, and that is the introduction to a book. Come on, up. What do we have in plan for today? Yeah, today we have uh, a book which was actually a, a lecture, an address delivered by Hazrat Muslim anhu called Dhikr Ilahi, Remembrance of God. And I personally find this book really, really useful um, because it tells you, kind of reminds you, gives you kind of, I would call them life hacks, tips of how to do things which we struggle with sometimes. For example, 
how do you wake up for prayer in the morning? Mm. And how the Muslim world has given dozens step by step, you know, this is what you can do. You can try this thing, you can try that thing. How, um, and you know, you find different steps for that. You can find different steps for how to remember God. So during the day, when we get busy during work, during school, what are the different things that we can do to try and remember God in different ways? Some may suit others more, some may suit others in a different way. And Hazrat Muslim who has very comprehensively shown people that no matter what kind of lifestyle you have, no matter how busy we might think we are, no we can always find something that suits us. Yeah. And that's the beauty of that book, that Hazrat Muslim literally goes, well, you guys can, you can try this. And if that doesn't work, then well, you can try this. And there's no, literally, there's literally no leeway for us to, to be able to say that there isn't a method that we could adopt that would work for us. And this is exactly what Dhikr Ilahi, the book actually talks about. It further also talks about when we do pray, um, what are the methods that we need to ensure to make sure that our prayer is right, it's correct. And there are step-by-step -step guides. Again, it says practically the book, the whole book in itself is basically a guide, step-by-step -step guide of how to pray properly. And it talks about our intentions. How should we, what should be our intention before we pray? What should we be thinking in our minds whilst we are praying? And you know what? You know how often should we pray? And, and all of these things are dealt with it quite deeply. And I think, especially for the youth, who often wonder. And you know, we come to a point where we might be praying. And sometimes, when you're young, you pray about something, um, and it is it isn't immediately accepted, or it isn't accepted the way you wanted it to be accepted. And you you may wonder. Why is that? What's going on? And so Hazrat Muslim also takes this question into account mm. and answers it in depth. That what are the different reasons? And there are many reasons that he, he actually talks about why a prayer may not be accepted. But then he talks about the fact that there's a greater wisdom behind that. And he numbers number one, number two, number three. That these are the different reasons why a prayer may not have been accept, expect, I mean, accepted. And you can then read that, go back and, and be like, okay, well, let me try this differently. Yeah. Maybe that's where I, I went wrong. Or maybe this is how I was thinking wrong about it. My perspective wasn't correct. So I don't want to tell anybody what those things are because in essence, they should really go and read it for themselves. Yeah. What those things are, and they are literally are gems. Gems of guidance, step by step. What is it that we can do to perfect our remembrance of God and do it in a way that's practical and we can actually do it um, and, and see it work. So that's always, as, as always, in, in the beautiful way, the eloquence of Hazrat Muslim Allah, and very easy to understand as yeah. well, especially for our younger viewers and younger members. And with that, we're going to go to our last segment for today, the health segment. Atik Bharti Sahib, a homeopathic consultant, is with us and he's going to tell us something new today and something um, that we can learn from. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to homeopathy and well-being. Now in today's episode, we actually look at injuries, specifically injuries which can be caused by falling, knocks um, and bangs and so forth. Symptoms uh, of uh, having an injury sometimes include bruising around the associated area, swelling, pain, broken bones, God forbid, and also sprains. So let's take football as an example. It's very easy sometimes to fall over when kicking a ball or when you're being tackled uh, for a football. Sometimes it can lead to a swelling around the ankle area itself, and this can cause pain as well as sometimes bruising. Sometimes you can fall over and you can knock or you can hit your knee, um, or you find that you fall over in such a way that your thigh becomes very sensitive uh, and very sore, and you find that there is some bruising. So what are the causes? Well, football, <laughs> I love football, but football is one, but any types of sports, sometimes you can just be in the park, children can be in the park playing, running around and they can um, have an injury which they didn't expect. Sometimes you can have injuries at home. There is no real uh, reason as to the cause. It's just sometimes being in the wrong place or um, perhaps uh, too much physical exertion and, and sometimes things don't work out. But the good news, however, is that there are very effective remedies in homeopathy to provide very good emergency treatment um, very, very uh, soon. Now these remedies include Arnica Montana, which is a fantastic medicine for injuries, um, football being one, um, general knocks. If you find there is any bruising on the body, Arnica is the chief remedy to go to. Now one remedy for muscular soreness or deeper injuries that you feel are a bit deeper than the muscle itself, perhaps even into the tissues, 
is a remedy called Bellis Perennis. Very, very effective when taken alongside Arnica itself, to be honest. Another medicine, which is often used for injuries, is a medicine called Apis Mellifica. And this is for any type of swelling associated with the injury. So for example, um, you have sprained your ankle and you find there is pain and swelling. Apis Mellifica, Arnica and Bellis Perennis can be combined and make a very uh, powerful unit together to help work towards any type of injury associated around the ankle area. However, there are three other remedies I would briefly mention, which are bone remedies. So sometimes you can fall and you feel that, God forbid, you know, um, perhaps the bone is, is slightly sore, or you, or you can feel um, pain which goes deeper than just the muscle. There are three homeopathic, well-known homeopathic medicines which are used for such injuries. These are Symphytum, Calcarea Floor, and Ruta. And these combined can be very, very effective. However, if you feel that the injury of, is of a severe nature, always seek professional medical advice. Jazakumullah. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum. Our homeopathic consultant. And Kamar Sahib, Jazakallah to you as well. I thoroughly enjoyed our discussion and uh, thank you very much for joining us here in the studio. We'll see you one more time throughout the, in, in the course of the month, inshallah. And we are going to see you again in our next program. Uh, don't remember, every weekday Ramadan with MTA is going to be with you. Uh, until next time, Assalamu alaikum.